Hello and welcome to Nikon Report, your weekly round of all the latest Nikon news and all other photographic announcements that we found interesting. Is Constant here? And this is Becky. And it's another week full of announcements. Announcement from Nikon. Were we expecting this? No, but we did see the leak obviously last week and now here it is, the 600mm f6.3 VRZ. That's right. Those rumor websites that can't just keep it in their pants <laughs> and 600mm have been leaked, but now it's here in the flesh. Yes, it is. <laughs> so this is a lens that sort of took us by surprise in that it's a PF sort of equivalent version of the 600mm f4 TCVR, which is obviously a spectacular, very high priced, top tier professional lens. And now we've got a smaller lightweight version. It is said to be about the same size and weight as the 500 PF F mount. So if you've got one of those or used one of those, then that's the size comparison for you. So speaking of weight, it's one kilogram, 470 grams with a tripod collar attached but you can remove it and then the weight is going to be just under 1400 gram. That's right. Now the minimum focusing distance is four meters. We've got 21 elements here in 14 groups, including two ED elements, one SR element, one PF element, and elements with nanocrystal coat and fluorine coated front element to all that dust and drip resistance is there on the front element for you. Now tell me, Becky, what is the SR element? So the S is for short wavelengths and the R is refractive. So SR lenses or SR glasses, short wavelength refractive lens elements. All that means is that you don't get so much color bleeding when the light hits the lens. Obviously you've got red, green and blue light and as it hits the lens you get less color bleed because of the way that the lens is coated. I'm, perhaps I'm oversimplifying it but I think that that's enough for most people to understand. That's right. And because there's so many elements in so many groups, the actually MTF chart looks delicious. What do you think? It looks incredible. We don't normally get to see the MTF charts so early on. And when we do, there's usually some little fall off there somewhere, but this one is all straight across. It's really nice. pretty good. And that lens will join the lightweight 400 and 800 millimeter lens. So think about this way. Yeah, so we have those big professional wide aperture lenses that cost a fortune. And we also have, I wouldn't say a budget version, but definitely a lot less expensive versions of those lenses for some of you who maybe don't want to spend so much on the bigger lenses. That's right. Now it is an internal focusing lens, which is great. So everything stays inside the lens when it's focusing and it is super fast and completely quiet focusing. It does have up to six stops of VR if you're using it on a camera which has synchro VR compatibility. So Z8 and Z9 in that case. And it is super sharp from what we can see in the sample images. In terms of external buttons on the lens, you've got function one, function two buttons that you can assign all the things for. You've got obviously a ring function ring that you can assign settings to. And also you have auto focus, manual focus switch, as well as full range or limited range switch as well. So the official announcement is the 11th of October, which is when, Today. when this video goes out. It will be shipping from late October and the price is here. Our advice as usual, if you want to get this lens as soon as possible, pre-order as soon as you can. We don't expect it to have a massive stocks arriving on day one, so it will be probably back-ordered like a lot of new releases with Nikon. So it makes sense if you really need this lens to go on this list as soon as possible. Now, Becky, what do you think? Who is this lens for? Portrait photographers? Always. I would say that if you are someone who perhaps has the 404.5 and you'd like a bit more reach with it and you've already got your TC 1.4 or TC 2 times teleconverter, then this is a nice addition to get you that extra reach. It gives you the sort of happy medium between the 400 and the 800. So if you can't quite stretch the 800 or you feel like that's too long for your purposes, then you've got the 600, which sits nice in the middle. It will work with both teleconverters. And we have seen some sample images shot with both converters. Nikon are generally recommending the 1.4, obviously, because it only loses you a stop of light, but they have shown us images with the two times converter. And it seems to be pretty impressive. So I would say if you've got both, there's no harm in using them. So if you think if you had two times teleconverter, so you'd be looking at two stops, so 6.3 becomes what, about F13, isn't mm -hmm. it? Okay. Well, as Nikon always says, you know, you may have difficulties focusing the lens in difficult lighting conditions, but on a bright 
sunny day, you shouldn't have any issues at all. What do you think? Is it nice to have the cheaper version of the more expensive lenses? Do you think Nikon is going for a very similar approach like they did with the 2.8 zooms where we had the expensive ones and then we have the cheaper version of those? Obviously, in this case, we get a smaller light weight, lower price. However, the aperture obviously is not as wide. Yes, and I think that's kind of a caveat that we have to expect with a lens that is the cost that it is and considering how much cheaper it is than the, the pro lens. Essentially, if you're a very keen wildlife photographer, but you're not going to be able to spend the, you know, 13, 14 thousand pounds that it would cost to get the 600 f4, then this is a really nice solution. And I think it kind of completes our telephoto lineup for now. Yes, I mean, the only lenses that normally come up are something like 200, 300 mil lenses. The short ones, yeah. And uh, I think it probably would be a good idea for Nikon to release 200 f2 lens. But at the same time, 300 f4e was also really nice and portable and was, was about the size of 24 to 70 f mount version, mm -hmm. which was really nice. But in terms of a long telephoto lens, I think we have a great lineup. Again, we just got released 180 to 600 millimeter lens. This one, I think in a way, at least if you're looking from mid to long telephoto lenses, I think we are covered. But what do you think? Do let us know in the comments below. One of the things that I mentioned, the 2.8 zooms where we have expensive and then less expensive ones, while well, they be in the same aperture. Mm. While well, they be in the same aperture, they're not S-type lens. Yes. Well, in this particular comparison, even the lightweight versions of the long telephoto lenses are Yes, so they have uh, superb optical elements in there and Nikon consider it to be fairly premium glass. Superior, in fact. Superior. Hence the S. I mean, the other thing I would say if you're considering a telephoto lens is the weight and the fact that this is only one and a half kilos, actually less than that, is kind of a big deal. I think that's probably one of its biggest strengths because if you compare it to the 600 f4, which is like double the weight, then... It, you do feel it when walking around with it for a whole day. So if weight is your other consideration, then this one's worth looking at. That's true. And then in terms of price, obviously 400 millimeter lens is about 3,000 pounds in UK, while 800 millimeter lens is 6,200 uh, pounds in UK. So this one sits right in the middle in terms of price. It's always difficult to talk about this glass as a budget option because it's definitely not. But when you go to that territory of long telephoto lenses, the prices just skyrocket. And obviously, for people who use those lenses, who shoot with those lenses, I guess they assume that those are reasonable prices for this type of equipment. Mm -hmm. Obviously, for some of us who never shot wildlife photography or with this type of lenses, those prices seem to be astronomical. But that's just the way this category of lenses is, I think. Yes. It's part of the territory, isn't it? Absolutely. So as we said, if you would like to pre-order yours, you can order it now from Grazer Westminster with a 10% deposit. And as soon as they start coming in, we'll let you know. Definitely. I'm looking forward to try it out and uh, do some macro photography to see how flowers look taken with this lens. That's what it's all about for you. <laughs> On to the other news. As it was rumors last week, and we mentioned really briefly, there was a rumor of Z9 firmware. And the day after the podcast lenses into your mailbox, Nikon released a version 4.10 firmware for Nikon Z9. So two important things that have been added is birds and airplanes recognition to air subject detection options. So we've tested ourselves, definitely have a look at this very, very short hands-on with it. We wouldn't call it test, but we just want to see does it actually work? <laughs> and it does actually work. It Spoiler does. alert. Um, if you'd like to update your firmware, we've also included the link in the description box below for you. Just bear in mind that this firmware is not, if you're downloading it on a Mac, is not in a zip file, which means that what you're downloading is the firmware file. We've had a few inquiries about that now. So just to make it super easy for any of you planning on updating your firmware soon. Absolutely. And then firmware can take up to six minutes. So don't panic if you don't see the status bar moving. So just let it go and it's going to do its own thing. Then Nikon also released an Xtether version 1.05 and wireless transfer utility version 1.11.0. We've all been waiting for those updates. And what did they add, Becky? They added support for the ZF in both cases. So when your ZF arrives, hopefully in the next few weeks, you'll be able to use NX Tether and wireless transmitter utility. Woohoo! You, you will have all the tools to take fantastic shots. That's right. Don't need to study anything. 
just update your software and you're good to go. go. Speaking of Nikon ZF, Nikon Japan announced a shipping date for Nikon ZF in Japan. Japanese releases are generally different from Western releases, and we've seen it in the past where some lens were released two, three weeks later, as well as ZFC, I believe. So yeah. what did they say, Peggy? So they said in Japan, the ZF, the 40mm kit, the extension grip, battery, battery charger, the whole lot is scheduled to be released on Friday, October 27th of this year. Now, they did say, please note that we've experienced more reservations for the ZF and 40mm lens kit than expected. And we'd like to thank those of you who have already made reservations. We may not be able to deliver the product on the same day of release. Surprise, surprise. All right. Are we still on track for the 12th of October released in the UK, Becky? Yes, we are. All right. Similar situation in that we have received a higher than, I suppose, what Nikon expected number of orders. So we won't be able to necessarily fulfill every day one order on day one. However, we will receive some stock on the 12th of October. Speaking of too many pre-orders, apparently Nikon Japan Direct said that Z135 planner lens has been pre-ordered so much that you should expect delays in shipment. So the waiting list is quite long on that one. Thank you in advance for your understanding. All right. Now, on some other news, a very famous 1200 to 1700 millimeter f5.6 to f8p lens was sold at Velta Camera Auction on 7th of October. Yes. For this lens, they suspect that there were no more than 35 copies made in total, and it's normally never seen in auction. This is an incredibly unusual lens. The first version started to hit the shelves in around 1994. Now, they haven't given us a final price for the sale, but they did say that it was estimated to be around 80 to 100,000 euros. So there you go. Yeah, and just a couple of photographs to just show you that if you had this lens, you would have to dress up like this gentleman on this picture over there. Compulsory. And don't tell me that hipster didn't exist back in the day. Now, one complaint about this lens, if it would come out today, is no arc suisse on a tripod foot. The lens would be canceled straight away. Yes. <laughs> no VR. It's been that way for 30 years. <laughs> no FS motor. Done. But it's 1200 to 1700 mil. Exactly. And you can definitely photograph Death Star with it. Yes, you could. On to some other news. Tamron officially announced 150 to 500 millimeter f5.6 to 6.7 D lens for Nikon Z mount. The rumors came out a week before the announcement, and apparently some German website listed it by mistake. Whoops. On their website. So Daisy. one thing normally people say placeholder and they would have a photograph of the same lens but for different mount. But actually one of the leaked images show the rear Z mount of the lens. Yes. I I didn't know that I would be excited to look at the rear of the lens. <gasps> but it's officially out. It's smaller than one H six hundred lens. And I assume that Tamron is expecting to compete in that territory with this lens. Yes, this is an unusual one. It's 230 grams lighter than the 180 to 600, obviously also cheaper, and was originally designed to compete with the Sony 200 to 600, but because of the 180 to 600 now existing in that same space, it does slightly clash, which is an unusual move from Tamron. And I am curious as to why this one exists, but glad it does. And here goes the saying that they said, oh, Nikon told them not to release a competing lenses. You Maybe know. Nikon don't think it competes with it because it's not the same. I don't know. It's an odd one. I mean, I personally think that because it's small and light, so it's not going to perform as well as Nikon one. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be a nice lens for travel. One of the analogies that comes to mind is the 2.8 zooms again that we talked about before, mm -hmm. where we had Nikon versions. And then we also have Nikon versions, which were small and lighter and made by a different company that is clearly Nikon. So I wonder if this is the case as well. So we're not really competing on the performance here. So if you want the best possible performer in that particular range, probably Nikon is going to be better. But this one is a smaller and lighter lens and cheaper. So if you travel, if you don't want to carry a bulk, that could be a very good option. What do you think? I would agree with you. I think that perhaps Nikon wouldn't consider this to be a direct competition because it's aimed at a slightly, let's say, lower or less enthusiastic market. I still think that considering it's 1,725 grams 
as a lens, you have to be pretty serious about your telephoto photography to carry that around. It's not, it's not a light lens at all. And all the wildlife photographer says is not heavy. No. Get good. Just get good, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's all you need to do, really. <laughs> it sounds like a skill issue, as my exactly. children would say. Exactly. <laughs> um, just hit the gym, you know, <laughs> and do your biceps workout. The price in the UK is £1,249.99. Okay, so that's a bit cheaper than £1,800 for Z1 6600. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, I don't think it's a direct competition, personally. But what do you think about this whole assumption that Nikon told to Sigma and Tamron never release lenses that compete with us, you know, that clash with our lineup. Obviously, we never had this confirmation, but I just want to hear your opinion. What do you think? Is it all fabricated information or is there some truth in it? Well, I saw the logic to it at the time. I completely understood why Nikon would say, look, Tamron, you can make your own lenses, just don't have them clash with our lenses, just so that we don't end up in direct competition because we want to work with you guys. And I don't think that Tamron have in any way, shape or form done this like off the books, as it were. They mm. haven't done this without Nikon's approval. I really genuinely think that Nikon would not see this as a direct competition to the 180-600. The timing, however, is not great for Nikon because there are people who are still waiting on the 180-600 deliveries. We have received a fraction of the number that are required to mm. keep up with demand. And I know that's the case all over Europe. I know that the States is a slightly different situation, but I think that if this lens had come out maybe another six months, then it would be a little bit clearer where they've drawn the line, if you see mm. what I mean. So close to the release of the 180 to 600 is odd to me. But I don't know. Would any of you who've already pre-ordered a 180 to 600 and who are waiting and don't see it coming before the end of October... Would you instead change to a Tamron lens, which should be out by the end of October, or would you prefer to stick with the Nikon? I think that's that's a question. That's true. I think they'll stick with Nikon for some reason, but definitely let us know in the comments below. But that's the thing. I think people who pre-ordered Nikon, they, they will stay with Nikon because they're keen Nikon enthusiasts. However, Tamron has been on the roll lately. I mean, the, all the lenses they released for Z-mount were quite frankly, superb. Even those Nikon 2.8 zooms that they released, you know, they were amazing. You know, the 1728, 2875 and uh, 7280. Fantastic you know. lenses, yeah. I'm personally out for competition. It's a free market. Release what you want and let the market decide. So do let us know in the comments below what do you think about this lens and does it have your pre-order. On to the other third party news. Lomography started a new Kickstarter for another golden lens they have this is the nor triplet v or i have five i'm not sure 2.0 slash 64 bokeh control art lens and this comes from a very traditional old design of lens where you can control your bokeh you can choose whether you want this kind of based on the sample images alone you can choose whether you want this like nice creamy soft focus effect or whether you want it to be nice and sharp in the middle with the dreamy bokeh around the outside the the images look very very interesting for this one and it will be available in nikon z mount yeah i mean well personally maybe i'm not a fan of that particular lens but i do appreciate to have different options in a world where everything's super sharp and clinical I love a bit of character, I love a bit of different look, and obviously it won't be for everyone, but he, people who, who would appreciate it, it's a nice option to have. They don't need to be logical in a way that now we're going for the best specs and sharpness, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. you know, when people buying expensive lenses and trying to degrade the image quality in the post just to make it to look like film, yeah, I think it's worth just having the options in camera with a particular lens to create that without spending too much time in the post-processing software. What do you think? Yes, I think that this is looks like a very, very quirky lens. And I love that they've put the whole history of the concept behind it of what the lens it's originally based off of is. And if you would like to back this campaign and support it, then it starts just $335. That's true. And normally I would be quite cautious of any Kickstarter campaigns just on the promise that it may not be delivered at some point. But because it's done by Lomography and they've been in the business for quite some time, I'm sure they will deliver. Speaking of other crowdfunding projects, this Agafilm Processor campaign started on Indiegogo and it's already been fully funded. What's Agafilm Processor? It's the film processor which takes its inspiration from the rotary processor similar to Jobo. 
Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you, some of you know what's a job with CP3 or CP3 process. That does basically the same thing without the bathtub to control the temperature. Mm-hmm. It will spin your partisan tank, a traditional partisan tank, which is quite freely available and not very expensive. Yep. Because it's going to spin, it will use less chemistry and it's got a temperature probe, so it will know the temperature inside the tank. And if the temperature slightly goes down or goes up during the development, it will adjust the time accordingly to that. The price is about 320 euros. This is a reasonable price for this type of equipment because if you start to look at jobos, I think CP3 starts at about 1,500 euros or so, and then CPP3 goes to about 3,000 euros. And what about the R2-D2? Uh, R2-D2 is not for sale <laughs> because it's in space. <laughs> so I personally think it's nice to see such projects coming from film enthusiasts. I think it's a definitely cheap alternative, not just for the film enthusiasts themselves, but also for the labs who have to process quite a few rolls. They do. Parts and time can process up to 835 millimeter reels. If you're doing the color, mm. there's a program for color there. There's a program for E6 slide processing as well, and also for black and white. Nice. And, they, and eventually they're planning to introduce ECN2 processing for the cinema Codec Vision 3 stocks. Excellent. Um, if you're interested in that, definitely hit that Indigo campaign and back it up if you want to. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us this week. Yes, thank you very much for watching and or listening. Please give us a like and a subscribe if you're on YouTube, a follow, a rating, or perhaps even a little review if you're listening on a podcast platform. Definitely give us some love on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Spotify all over the world. We also publish some photographs on social channels like Instagram all over the world. Sometimes we do. And when we do, you can find us at Rebecca underscore Danese. You can find the shop at Nick on at Grey's. And me at Constantin Koshkin. We will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye.